You're listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up! Podcast. Another glorious, victorious episode presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports. Powered by Overtime Media, I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, my partner in crime. You know him and love him as your Denver Broncos reporter for 24-7 Sports. He is Zach Kellerman. Zach, I don't know how much more we can convey to our listeners in terms of our excitement to get on that airplane, but we're only uh, we're that much closer to Indianapolis, my brother. We are, and you know, we, we talk about it a lot, but it is an exciting moment, not just for us, but for the site, for the fans, for Broncos country. We're really, really pumped to bring it to everyone, and the content that we're going to crank out is going to be unlike any other outlet, blog, site, anywhere else that you can find. You're going to want to stick it right here, and um, I just, I really am pumped, Chad. So what we're going to do today, we have a great show planned for you for Tuesday, because then we are supposed to be off on Wednesday. That's when Building the Broncos publishes. We'll see how it shakes out in terms of real time. Zach and I being able to set time aside to podcast. We're not sure exactly when it's going to be Wednesday. Hopefully Wednesday night that we get home from the facility being there, uh, or I should say back to our rooms, uh, and we can crank out a podcast for you. So there might be days, there probably will be days, many days uh, in the coming week where there's one or two podcasts per day for you guys to consume between Huddle Up and building the Broncos, so look forward to that. But first, before we jump into today's topic, which we're going to go through an, an entire mock free agency scenario that the great Bob Morris put together on the website over the weekend, first, you guys, make sure you're following the show on Twitter for reasons already discussed many times, but if you want to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening in Broncos country, what's happening on the pre-draft trail, what's happening at the Combine, and really what's happening with the Huddle Up podcast, Easiest thing to do, follow the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. Also, if you haven't done it, take time, leave a creative review, rate the show, especially on iTunes, especially on Stitcher and CastBox. You guys have no idea how much that can help us grow and reach new listeners. And both Zach and I relish and appreciate all the engagement on the other podcast listening platforms, including YouTube. All the listeners there and the comments and the engagement is phenomenal. The feedback is great. But the best way to help us grow and reach new listeners is to leave those those comments and rate and uh, review the show, especially on iTunes. So take care of that. Hey, everybody. If you've been thinking about pulling the trigger on becoming a Mile High Huddle 24-7 Sports VIP subscriber, but you haven't quite gotten over the hump, now's the time. Starting Monday and ending Tuesday night, the final week of February, you can get six months of Mile High Huddle VIP for the price of one. For less than 10 bucks, you can get locked in on all things Broncos for the next half year. That takes you through the combine, through free agency signing period, through the draft, through offseason training, through training camp and preseason, and into September when the 2019 football season kicks off in earnest. So stop what you're doing and go to milehighhuddle.com right now, click on the green banner, and sign up using the monthly option, and you'll automatically get five additional months added to your subscription for free. Don't wait. Don't waste this golden opportunity to get access to our VIP-only Friday mailbags. Zach and I will be in Indy all week, hot on the combine trail of what's happening with your Denver Broncos in the draft. And believe me when I say, if you don't have access to the MHH Insiders Forum, you're going to be missing out a lot. VIP-only. This is a no-brainer. Go capitalize on this hot sale. All right, Zach, so... Today we're going to go through this interesting, interesting article that Bob Morris wrote over the weekend. You guys follow Bob Morris on Twitter, at Bob Morris Sports. He's kind of our go-to cap uh, guru, our, our financial guy for our website that just does all the, the painstaking research that you know I wouldn't say that we don't want to do, but is so time-consuming to do. We don't always have the means, Zach or myself or any of the other guys, to do the research that Bob does, and it pays massive dividends for the site, for the VIP subscribers, and all the great readers of the website. And on Sunday, he per, uh, published an article entitled Mocking the Ideal Free Agency Hall for the 2019 Broncos, in which he basically goes through on a on a subject, on a player-by-player basis, on whether it's you know re-signing certain players, 
which players get tendered, and then signing outside free agents. And it's really well-researched, painstakingly so. I use that word again. So I recommend all of you guys go and read that piece. But Zach and I are going to go through this and kind of analyze it and see what kind of conversation we can turn up from this. And the first thing on Bob's list, Zach, is he, and we, we know this isn't necessarily news or any kind of shocker, but just like we've heard the Broncos plan to do, he is declining Brandon Marshall's option, which goes from takes the Broncos from their thirty seven projected thirty seven point five million dollars in cap space and actually grows it to forty one point eight million. It's a no brainer to me. It's one of the first moves that I thought would happen, and sure enough, the Broncos were making the right choice here and getting younger and better at that position. Elway and Fangio want to rebuild the middle. They're reportedly not going to bring back Domita Pecco and Brandon Marshall. They want to get faster, younger, more explosive with Fangio, who knows what he's doing. The Broncos have a defensive coach who knows what he's doing. It's a great uh, time to be a Broncos fan in that sense. But yeah, uh, it's it's free money for Denver. I mean, Marshall was a good player, but he really declined and he can't stay on the field. And you can't make the club from the tub. That's right. Absolutely. And he'll have a market, to be honest with you guys, out there uh, in free agency. It might not be quite as lucrative as that four-year deal he signed with Denver two years ago. Uh, I guess it's, yeah, well, coming up on three years in actual time. But he'll find some money for himself out there on the market. Now, the next thing here that Bob does in his mock free agency, he's kind of GM for a day for the Denver Broncos, is he tenders – He goes ahead and tenders each and every exclusive right free agent. Now, that includes the likes of Tim Patrick, Elijah Wilkinson, Joe Jones, Gerald Garcia-Williams, and DeMonte Thomas, who, Zach, you talked about on yesterday's show as having a place on this defense moving forward. And by doing so, it decreases the cap space the Broncos have to work with ever so slightly down uh, to $41.3 million. I'm a big DeMonte Thomas fan. I think he brings a lot to the table, and he showed a lot under the previous coaching staff, so he's a no-brainer. And I agree here. To be nitpicky, I'd maybe not bring back Garcia Williams because the Broncos right. are flush with inside linebackers, but uh, Patrick Wilkinson and Jones, to me, and Thomas are all just uh, no doubts. I really look forward to There's three players. Well, four. I'm with you. Gerald Garcia Williams is a weird situation because he was originally brought in as an off-ball linebacker, and then right. last year before he got hurt, he was playing edge. So I don't know what the Denver Broncos have in store or plan for Gerald Garcia-Williams, but if you look at Tim Patrick, Elijah Wilkinson, Joe Jones, and DeMonte Thomas, all four of those guys have, I can see carving out real productive roles on this team moving forward. And I wouldn't mind seeing, just like I harped on the podcast all through last season, I want to see Joe Jones on defense, dude. Yes, and I want to see Tim Patrick getting a shot as a number three receiver. And, and Wilkinson looked good as a starting guard. I mean, the Broncos have some players here, and getting it back under cheaply under contract, to me, um, it's very fortunate for Elway, considering the other decisions he has to make. Interesting thing about Timmy P is that, you know, every, we all had these high hopes for Cortland Sutton that he was going to be able to take on the mantle as, as a starter post Demarius Thomas trade. But really, if you look at his production, it was spiked up to that point and then diminished from week nine on, but you know who didn't? Tim Patrick. Tim Patrick, if you go back and look at his production last season, he really stepped up to the plate, and where Cortland Sutton wasn't winning his matchups, wasn't creating separation, you had guys like Tim Patrick and, of course, Deshaun Hamilton step in to fill the gap. That's right. And, you know, Cortland Sutton lit up training camp and the preseason. It became a thing on Twitter, like a meme almost that he was doing it. But when he wasn't, it was Tim Patrick doing it. He looked good in in the summer. He turned it on when the games counted for real. Um, The Broncos could have a player there. And to me, he looked a lot better and a lot more developed last year uh, than Deshaun Hamilton did. Yeah. Next thing here on the mock free agency for the 2019 Broncos is Bob's going to tender the uh, Shelby Harris as a restricted free agent at the second round level. And what that does is it really disincentivizes other potentially interested suitors from making uh, or signing him to an offer sheet and thus uh, making the odds pretty high that Harris remains with the Broncos in 2019. But in so doing, uh, it's estimated that it's going to cost Denver $3.1 million to tender Harris at that level, which reduces the cap space to $38.8 million. I know the Broncos don't have to, but I would even consider using a first-round tender on Harris. That's how much I like the guy. The guy is a stud. He's probably going to start next year for Pecco in the middle. Um, this money they're going to pay him is is so undeserving of what he brings to the table since coming over from the Raiders as a cast-off there. I would even consider locking him down long-term. I'm just a big Shelby Harris fan, so yeah, I'm all on board with this. 
Next up, Bob extends Derek Wolf for not one, but two more seasons. And in so doing, he minimizes his cap hit in 2019, freeing up a little bit more money and paves the way, of course, for Derek Wolf to potentially finish his career and retire as a Bronco. But what this extension does is reduces his 2019 cap number from $10.9 million to $8.9 million, which is a little bit more indicative of what the Broncos will probably do, and increases the cap space back up to $40.8 million. Yeah, I'm of uh, in the minority where I could see the Broncos cutting Derek Wolf, or I wouldn't shed a tear if he was cut. But if they're going to bring him back, I'd prefer the Broncos have a better salary arrangement than they have right now. And this would actually make a lot of sense. I'm not sure the Broncos would want to do it. He, they really have all the leverage here, uh, but I could see it happening for sure. Next up is a renegotiation between the Denver Broncos and Ronald Leary on his 2019 salary. Now, as it stands, Leary has $5.15 million of his 2019 base salary, which is total of $8.15 uh, guaranteed. So just over $5 million guaranteed for injury, meaning that the Broncos would be on the hook for that money. You wrote about this, Zach, yep. if they cut him because he is still technically recovering from that Achilles injury. So what Bob's proposing is that the Broncos offer Leary $6 million in a fully guaranteed base salary, plus a quarter million in a roster bonus that will be due uh, in exchange for converting $2.15 million of his remaining base salary into incentives. So he's turning it into incentives so he could perhaps earn that money back, giving him a little bit more guaranteed no matter what because of his injury, but reducing the total number through incentives, and in so doing, increases the cap space to $42.7 million. This I'm more on board with than the Derek Wolf thing. I think Leary, when he's healthy, is a really good player. And under Mike Munchak, I think he could be a pro bowler. And the Broncos are going to have to keep Joe Flacco upright. It's, it's, in, you know, it's imperative they do that. So I'm on board with also uh, maybe you know incentivizing Leary a little bit and getting some cap relief and also keeping him around. And I could see Leary actually being okay with this type of a restructure because oh, yeah. it increases the amount he would be guaranteed no matter what happens with his injury this year. And then it allows him to, if he's got a little pride on the line, say, look, I know that once I'm healthy, I can earn that money through my participation in my play. So this is something I could see him actually taking a shine to. Yeah, it gives the Broncos and both the player and the team incentives, and it's a win-win all around. So I can, I'm totally on board with Bob's idea here. Next thing here is Bob wants to re-sign long snapper Casey Kreider. Now, Kreider is a restricted free agent, technically, but obviously he's not going to be worth any of the uh, the right of first refusal tenders. So, Because if you do any of those right of first refusal tenders, it would be estimated at slightly more than a $2 million contract. And you know, do you really want to sign long snappers to that kind of money on, a, on an annual basis, APY <laughs> basis? So... What he's saying, though, is sign him to a short-term deal that's more in line with other long snappers. He proposes a three-year, $3.5 million deal, which comes with just under half of that fully guaranteed. And in so doing, it gives him a 2019 cap hit of uh, $1 million and reduces the cap space ever so slightly to $42.3 million. But you take care of your long snapper position. He's barely making a little bit over... You know, NF- the NFL mean for long snappers, and he's a Pro Bowl caliber player. He put, made it the Pro Bowl this year. He is, and I'm sure the long snapper market's not going to be on fire this offseason, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not on board with it. He could snap a ball pretty well. All right, next thing is Bob resigns Billy Turner. Now, remember, when I say these articles, this article is painstakingly researched. Bob is utilizing different contacts and tools to factor what these deals would look like in reality. So this isn't Bob just pulling numbers out of thin air. Okay, These are numbers based on real research and what he's hearing and what the market is most likely to bear. So the Broncos, we know, have shown an interest in extending Billy Turner, and he's doing just that. He gives Billy Turner a three-year deal worth $15 million in total money, with $5 million fully guaranteed. Now, for Billy Turner, who was a third-round pick of the Dolphins a few years back, this is a big step up in money. This is something I could see him definitely jumping on, depending on what maybe his value is on the open market. If the Broncos could get this to him well in time before he hits the market, I think this is a no-brainer for him to sign. What it does, though, is it gives him a cap hit of $3 million in 2019 and reduces the cap space to $39.9 million, Zach, but now you have your swing guy locked down. He can play guard. He can play tackle. 
Yeah, I give you credit too, Chad, because you wanted the Broncos to bring him back, and the next day it was reported the Broncos are entering negotiations with him, and they want to bring him back, and it's absolutely the right move. A guy who can play all four spots, who started uh, guards, tackle, hard to find, um, dependable, played really well last year after all the injuries. I mean, he held up pretty well. Uh, he's not going to be a long-term starter, but it's always good to have those versatile swing guys on the roster. Um, again, a move that I'm in total agreement with with Bob. Yep. And in fairness, too, I think the first guy to really start pounding the table for Billy Turner to get re-signed uh, amongst our staff was Nick Kendall, who wrote an article, I don't know, early January, three reasons why the Broncos should bring back Billy Turner. So if you guys haven't read that, go check it out. Now, here's the last thing, and then we're going to take a break and talk about the signings outside free agents that Bob has in this mock. The last thing, though, on the table is trading Case Keenum. Now, in this scenario... Bob finds a way, and we know this is a possibility, we talked to Benjamin Albright about it, to deal him to the Arizona Cardinals to kind of serve as the veteran stopgap back up to Josh Rosen. Now this trade, Zach, that Bob has for Case Keenum, the Broncos send a 2019 seventh rounder along with Keenum for a 2020 conditional pick, in you know exchange for a 2020 conditional pick of the Cardinals. Uh, the Broncos would be guaranteed a sixth-round pick, he says here, but it would could go up to a fifth or fourth rounder based on whether or not Keenum starts any game. So that's kind of how it would play out on the conditional side. But trading Keenum, we talked about this on yesterday's show, would free up $18 million in cap space, but that is also countered, as Bob talks about here, by the eventual acquisition of Flacco and that $18.5 million base salary. So unloading him, though, and including Joe Flacco, $39.4 million in cap space to work with as the Broncos go out to you know, negotiate with outside free agents. To me, it doesn't matter what the Broncos would get back for Keenum. They can get a seventh-round pick or a bag of footballs. It's a salary dump move for Denver to get that salary off the books, clear $18 million with only $3 million in dead money as opposed to eleven in, in cap space and $10 million in dead money. It's a big difference. So it doesn't matter where they send them. They can send them to Washington or Arizona, seventh-round pick, conditional. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Uh, if they can get that money back and recoup that, they have to do it. All right, so we still have a lot to get to on today's show, but real quick, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, so now we get to the outside signings. We've figured out how Bob whittled down the available cap space, the different moves he chose to make to retain certain players, trade certain players. And so now we finally arrive at what the fruits of those moves can be in terms of bringing in outside talent. And the first thing Bob does with that money is he signs safety Adrian Amos, formerly of the Chicago Bears. Now, in this mock, he's signing um, Amos to a four-year, $38 million contract based on what he's seeing out there and using, utilizing the tools available to us. And in so doing, it results in a $6 million cap hit for 2019, reduces the Broncos' available cap space act to $34 million. I'm all for it. I, I think the Broncos will sniff around Landon Collins if he gets out of New York. But this is the perfect guy right here. And even a Amos hinted at the fact that Denver would be an ideal spot because he knows the defense. They need a safety opposite Justin Simmons. He'd be a perfect complement to him. He wouldn't break the bank like Collins would. Four and 38 would be very manageable for yeah. someone of his caliber. The Broncos can grow with him for the future under Fangio and Donatel. So uh, this is the signing I want most in free agency. I think the Broncos will make it happen. The other thing he mentions here, Bob, is that in signing Amos, it ca it cancels out a possible compensatory pick the Broncos would get back in exchange for losing Matt Paradis, who in this mock he doesn't sign because of what Paradis is, is asking for, demanding in his contract. So, you know, obviously, as we touched on in the previous uh, decisions Bob made to bring certain players back, Paradis isn't brought back, and he's probably not going to be brought back because of the type of money he is seeking. So it's really a bummer, but onwards and upwards for the Denver Broncos. Now, the next pick, Zach, is, or I should say signing, is Juwan James. The Denver Broncos are getting their right tackle of the future here, a guy that can come in on a four-year deal worth $34 million and $10 million in fully guaranteed money and really serve Zach as a set-and-forget player at right tackle and solve that problem for the Denver Broncos. Now, this deal that gets dealt to Juwan James gives him a cap hit in 2019 of only $5.5 And so the Broncos' cap space is reduced to $29 million. 
The Broncos really wanted James last year. They were pretty close to acquiring him. And then when they didn't, they settled for Jared Valdir, who's now a free agent. The Broncos, I think, will keep keep Valdir's name on the speed dial, but they're going to go after an upgrade. And Jawan James would be a massive upgrade there. If they can get him, I'd be all for that. That's not a ba- you know a cap-devastating contract. They can do it. They can manage it. Uh, they're going to lose some players. I wouldn't worry too much about compensatory picks for someone like Shaquille Barrett. They have to upgrade the O-line and provide stability for Joe Flacco. Indeed, absolutely. So we move on here. The next thing Bob does with the free agent cap dollars is signs Jonathan Hankins. Now we know there have been reports tying the Broncos to Jonathan Hankins, and it wouldn't be the first time Hankins has been tied to a possible landing spot in Denver. In this mock, Hankins gets a three-year deal worth $21 million, $8 million fully guaranteed. Now his 2019 cap hit would be $4 million, so the Broncos' cap space – falls to 25.6 million Zach which is still plenty of money left to sign the players were still left to talk about here I was really bummed last year when the Clinton McDonald signing did not work out because the Broncos badly need an interior disruptor along the defensive line, and that's what Hankins can bring. He's also a pretty good run stuffer, yep. but they have no pocket-pushing presence, not counting Demarcus Walker and not counting Derek Wolf. They need a young guy there, and he would take over as that key backup if Shelby Harris were to start for nose tackle uh, for Doma Topeco. So I, I'm, I would be on board with bringing him in. I think that's a good value for him, and Fangio cannot get enough of those defensive linemen. So for those of you pining for C.J. Mosley, we hate to be the bearers of bad news, but there are more there's more buzz saying that the two sides are closer to terms on an extension. So the next guy on the list, if you really, as as we've talked about on the show the last couple days, Fangio and the Broncos are looking to beef up that that redo the entire revamp, I should say, the middle of the defense. And so in this mock, Bob goes out and signs Quan Alexander, formerly of the Tampa Bay Bucks. Now. Alexander is a tackling machine. He's got speed, so he can go sideline to sideline. He really is ideal for the Fangio scheme. He gets a three-year deal worth $18 million. His 2019 cap hit would be $5 million, which reduces the cap space for the Broncos to $21.2 million. I would like this. I'm, I'm a little more wavy than Bob is. I think the Broncos can go either way. I'm interested to see what Josie Jewell can do. And I think Devin White would be a great draft pick in the first round otherwise. But yeah, they're going to have to upgrade at ILB with Brandon Marshall gone. Uh, Todd Davis left there. He would be a good signing. And TJ Mosley won't happen. I just think the Broncos can uh, still do better with a guy like Devin White. His next move, and this is one where I start to, I, you know, with where he's prioritized the cap dollars up to this point, I understand why this next guy was the, the signing, but he's the first one that to me is a little bit lackluster, and that's Brian Poole, cornerback formerly of the Atlanta Falcons. In this mock, Poole gets a three-year deal worth $17 million, and he gets $7 million fully guaranteed. His cap number for 2019 would be $5 million, which reduces Denver's cap space to $16.7 million. And because Poole is in this scenario, he's actually, well, in reality, he's a restricted free agent, uh, not tendered by his team. We, we don't expect the Falcons, in other words, to a tender of first right of refusal. So in this scenario, he doesn't negate what could potentially be a compensatory pick for the Broncos uh, in the future. So your thoughts, though, on Brian Poole as a potential low-key, under-the-radar addition to kind of bolster the stability of the cornerback depth? No, I'm with you, Chad. I think the Broncos can do better and get younger. If they're going to go for a free agent, make it like a guy like Bryce Callahan or Kareem Jackson, Poole to me doesn't really move the needle. And I'd rather the Broncos then would just look to the draft in the first round and get a guy like DeAndre Baker, Greedy Williams, whatever. Yeah, I I would not uh, prioritize Poole among the Broncos' first wave of signings. Now, we don't have a tight end yet. We know the Broncos. We talked about this yesterday. Broncos need to spend some money on the tight end position. And in Bob's mock, they do just that by signing former Kansas City Chief Demetrius Harris, the mountain of a man himself. He gets a three-year, $10 million contract with $4 million guaranteed and brings a cap charge in 2019 of $2 million, so the Broncos still have uh, $15.3 million in cap space left. Yeah, this is one veteran I like a lot, and I mentioned on the last podcast the Broncos have to prioritize this position more than people think because they have two young, untested guys who they can't rely on. Harris actually burned Denver, Broncos fans will remember. I believe it was that first Kansas City game last year. He made that big catch down the sideline, yeah. set that game-winning score. He's an athletic pass-catching tight end who would give Joe Flacco, who loves his tight ends, another guy over the middle. So, yeah, I'm on board with this for sure. And he's just been buried behind one of the top two tight ends. In the NFL. That's true. So it's his time to shine. Now, 
The Broncos could also use a little depth on the edge behind Von Miller, Bradley Chubb, and ostensibly Jeff Holland. And so instead of going out and spending probably a, what would be a lot more money on Aaron Lynch in Chicago, in Bob's mock, he signs Brandon Copeland, who is formerly of the New York Jets. He gets a two-year, $7 million deal. His cap hit in 2019 would be $2.75 million. So the Broncos would have $13.1 million left in cap space. And you know what? I wouldn't use a, that money for this position. It would be a luxury, not a necessity. They have two of the best pass rushers in the NFL already. They have Jeff Holland, who I think is ready to break out. I would maybe draft someone to stick back there as a number four guy. I would not devote you know $7 million to this guy uh, for that spot. All right. Now, the last thing here is he designates Darian Stewart a post-June 1st cut. So what that does is basically it rolls it into – it gives the Broncos some options. So, in other words, after June first, it get, would give the Broncos seventeen point five million in cap space. So they're able to use that money to sign their rookie class, uh, which is going to cost about nine million bucks. So once that's all said and done, by doing this with Darian Stewart designating him a post June first cut, that leaves the Broncos in this scenario with still eight point five million in cap space. That's post-signing the draft picks, which leaves the Broncos, Zach, a little wiggle room in case a guy goes down in camp or they end up not being as strong at a certain position as they thought they'd be and any late emergency type addition similar to Evan Mathis in 2015. Yeah, this is the preference, but pre or post June 1st, Stewart's going to be cut. It's a no-brainer. All right, so that pretty much covers it. Again, it's fun to go through and dissect this and you know offer our analysis on the way Bob envisions the ideal free agency hall for the Denver Broncos. Great conversation, but it's an even better read. So go check that out on the website, easy to find. And in the meantime, we're going to take a couple questions from the a Twitter version of the Mile High Mailbag. We'll be right back. All right, so it's that time of the week, you guys, where we take a peek inside the Mile High Mailbag Twitter version because Zach and I are your football priests, and each and every week we are here to offer you the absolution and answers to your burning Broncos questions. And the first one here, we're just going to grab a couple because we're, we're kind of running long. But the first one comes from... I don't even know, Zach, how to <laughs> pronounce homeboy's name, uh, xxbiblicalsxx at Gmail. Okay, so now we all know um, his, his, his <laughs> email account, but he's a great listener and very engaging on Twitter. So shout out to you, my dog. Thanks for listening. We appreciate your question. Here, here's what he says, though. I am not a VIP yet, but I was wondering what you think our O-line is going to look like this year and whether they can protect our QB being Joe Flacco or perhaps a coming draft pick. First of all, pull that trigger on that VIP and join us. You're going to want to for the combine this week. Second of all, you know, you have Garrett Bowles as that left tackle who's been kind of inconsistent, obviously. But with Mike Munchak, I think he will be an above average starter. Uh, left guard, you'll have Ronald Leary coming back, who I think will be a pro bowler. So you're good on that left side. You're pretty solid. Center, I would push to bring back Paradis, but if he wants to be the highest paid center in the NFL, it's not happening in Denver, so they're going to move on from him. The good thing is, though, you have a ready-made center on the roster in Connor McGovern. You can slide him in there. Right guard's more tenuous, and right tackle, of course, is more tenuous. It wouldn't be a Broncos offseason without a right tackle question. <laughs> um, they will probably, like you know, we mentioned Juwan James, Jared Valdez will fall back. They'll prioritize that. They'll have a good player there. Right guard, to me, is the only you know creaky spot, and it scares me because the Broncos will let up interior pressure to a statue under center and Joe Flacco they have to keep him upright as you alluded to in the question it is key paramount to the Broncos success in 2019 keeping Flacco off the ground if they can they can win but if they get sacked and goes down he's in a break and the Broncos would be right back where they left off this offseason all right so here's one more question here it's kind of a two-parter it's from Broncos burner at Broncos burner on Twitter his question is in relation to I believe that, uh, yeah, so for Brett Rippon, his question is, I talk about it was actually a part of a conversation on Twitter in terms of Rippon having the potential to be a franchise-caliber quarterback. What Broncos Burner's question is, the first part of it, Zach, I'll have you answer it, and then we'll get to the second one, is what do you think would need to happen in terms of the lay of the land, the right system, the right team for Brett Rippon uh, to work out as a franchise quarterback in the NFL? 
I mean, a system can only take him so long, but he has to have the talent too. And that's debatable whether he has the talent to be an NFL franchise quarterback. It's a big leap going from Boise to, you know, the pros. Um, in the right system with Scangarello, who is, you know, noted for his QB development, if he lives up to that, they can mold him. They can get something out of him. But whether he can be a, a 10-year starter, a, a, a championship quarterback, I'm not sure he has that talent in him. And you can't coach talent. So as a fifth rounder, I'm all good with Brett Ripien. As a first rounder, as a potential franchise quarterback, obviously, I wouldn't tie my hopes to him. And I will say too that it will not surprise me if he has if he crushes the combine and does really well at his pro days. It wouldn't surprise me to see Brett Rippon sneak into the back end of round one. But I see him more as a as a day two, perhaps early day three draft pick this coming season. But uh, Broncos burner his his second part to this is. Do you see the Broncos having the ability, he's very interested in Brett Rippon, to create the right system for a quarterback of Rippon's traits in the near future? And my answer to this, and I'll serve this over to you, Zach, is that, and you talked a lot about it in in the answer to his first part of his question, and that is that the Broncos are are really blessed to have Scangarello because what Rich Scangarello can do is not only identify – the right quarterback talent that's going to fit his scheme. But once he gets that, he's talked about it publicly. He wants to identify first what that quarterback's strengths are. What does he do well? And then scheme and structure around that, which portends well for any quarterback, whether you're Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers, or Brett Rippon. Because if your coach is consistently trying to put you into situations on the field that are going to maximize your natural gifts and and tendencies – that's what you want. And instead of, for example, the type of old school, my way or the highway type of offensive schemer like Gary Kubiak, who wants Peyton Manning to come in and play under center and play his system instead of saying, look, let's try to find a hybrid so I can maximize what you do best. This is kind of reverse engineering it, Zach, from the other way, where Scangarello is all about finding what the guy does best. And it's not like he's saying neglect what he doesn't do well and just ignore his, his downside, but rather focus on what he does do well, scheme around that while working to improve the areas that still need a little help. Right. And, you know, everyone lauds and loves the Scangarello hire, and for good reason. The Broncos needed to evolve. They needed to go younger, and he's plucked right from the Shanahan Kubiak tree. But the Broncos are also taking a huge risk with a guy who's never been a coordinator at this level and who's been riding the coattails, necessarily, of Kyle Shanahan. If he comes close to living up to what he can bring to the table, Scangarello, if the Broncos are getting the coach they think they're getting, he can mold any quarterback. He did it with Beathard, he did it with Garoppolo and Mullins. His track record in San Francisco is pretty good. That's why the Broncos hired him. That's why he is where he is right now. So if it is Brett Ripping, and if it is Drew Locke, Haskins, Murray, whoever, the Broncos have confidence that Scangarello can make that guy a starter. I just think, though, they're going to prioritize Drew Locke and not chance it on another project or mid-round guy yeah. like Rippey. And Elway can't afford to gamble once, once you know, again after the Lynch disaster. And I'm still saying, you know, everyone's like, well, the, the Flacco trade kind of puts the kibosh on Denver moving up in the draft. I wouldn't quite put that to bed. I will not be surprised if Elway maneuvers, even if it's only one or two spots, yep. to get the quarterback that he wants in this coming draft because – we talked about it over and over again. You can't go with a terrible need at quarterback. You can't go two years in a row with a top 10 pick without coming out with your guy. And so this is your opportunity to do that. You're possibly your last opportunity as GM of the Denver Broncos to have a top 10 pick and still missing the quarterback. Go get the quarterback. So I think that's going to happen this time around. I still don't see Denver moving from 10 to 2 and, and really mortgaging the future unless the, the Niners give them a great deal. But I'm, I can definitely see Elway moving up to 8 to get Drew Locker, to get his guy, whoever it may be, Haskins. They have to get a guy on the roster. And we say it all the time, Chad, you just said it now. They can come away from the second year in a row, top 10 pick, and not have that franchise quarterback in place. Even if he doesn't pan out, even if he busts, the Broncos have to still try and swing for the fences. They cannot be gun-shy. They cannot be tentative. They're in a crossroads right now, and Elway can't be scared. He has to be aggressive and get his man, whoever that may be. Absolutely. Well, that's going to do it for today's show. You guys, here's a reminder. This is the last time we're going to talk to you before we are in Indianapolis for the Combine. So a couple things you need to do to get ready. We are, in case you missed it, we're running a VIP sale on the website. The last two days, you guys, you've got to capitalize on that. Take advantage of that. 
it's your opportunity to get locked in, I think, for several months for the price of one. So that gets you from now until the free agency through the draft, leads you all the way up until the beginning, basically, of the preseason. So you're going to want to jump on that. Also, make sure you're following all the proper social accounts, both Zach and I on Twitter, at Kelberman247, at Chad and Jensen, the podcast account, at Huddle Up Pod. Make sure also you are following the Facebook accounts, Go find Denver Broncos on 24-7 Sports on Facebook. Find At Mile High Huddle on Facebook. Follow both of those accounts because we're going to be dropping all kinds of content during our time at the Combine. Sometimes it might be a live video on Facebook. might be a live video on Twitter. might be a podcast. You never know what it's going to be, and you just don't want to miss out on where we might pop up and bring you some analysis and some buzz on what we're seeing. So take care of that. Don't forget to capitalize on the VIP sale. In the meantime, we'll talk to you again in Indy for Zach Kelberman. I'm Chad Jensen. Talk to you then. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.